Hi, this is Don Forsythe. Our topic today is teams. Teams may be the most wildly successful of all groups. A hundred years ago, certainly there were teams, but primarily they were on playing fields, for example, and occasionally in, in work settings. Nowadays, though, teams seem to be everywhere. It used to be you'd take your car into the shop and talk to Ed the mechanic, and he said he'd get around to your car as soon as he could, but Nowadays, you take it into the shop and your car is turned over to a team of mechanics, technicians, who will work on your automobile. A surgery, uh, once done, uh, of course, by a physician who from time to time asked his surgical nurse for a scalpel, uh, other tools of the trade. Uh, but nowadays, uh, a team of surgeons generally attends to, to one's needs, uh, even scientists. Uh, Scientists often in the past worked alone diligently at their tasks, but these days science tends to be done in groups, groups which are highly organized and usually described as teams. Team science is the wave of the future. We're going to talk today about teams, uh, deal with some basic issues such as defining teams and identify the types of teams there are, and then we'll move on to analysis of uh, team processes and ways to improve teams. Thank you, as always, for joining me. In terms of a, just a brief history of the use of the word teams, certainly animals uh, have been described uh, as teams when they're harnessed together, usually to pull heavier loads than a single animal can bear. Apparently the word comes from a much older word meaning bridle. There's also a more obscure source of the word team with a slightly different spelling um, to bring forth to birth. Uh, once used, for example, in, in the same context as the word litter, a litter of animals, uh, but generally means these days teeming with life, um, as it were. But humans, people working collectively, were not described as a team until relatively recently, as it turns out. But nowadays, the idea is quite cut on, and you find that uh, most people, at least in the United States, in the workplace, uh, do work individually, but in corporate settings, industrial settings, and in particularly in nonprofit settings, teams are primarily used in the workplace. What is a team? Uh, the debate continues on how to best define the concept of a team. Uh, Richard Hackman, he distinguished between teams and what he called real teams. He pointed out that in many cases people refer to a group as a team when it really lacks the, the, the defining characteristics of a true team, which for Dr. Hackman included uh, clear boundaries, uh, specificity of the authority of the group members, and stable memberships within the group. Ketzenbach and Smith, uh, in a strong statement of teams back in the 1990s, uh, stated that a team is a small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and approach for which they are mutually accountable. Uh, Lee Thompson's definition is very straightforward. A team is a group of people who are interdependent with respect to information, resources, and skills who seek to combine their efforts to achieve a common goal. Uh, when I think about a, a team, um, I generally consider it to be a group, of course, but a particularly unique kind of group. Back earlier in our analysis of groups, way back in chapter one, we listed a couple of key characteristics of groups, uh, interaction among members, seeking goals typically, interdependence among members. Groups tend to be structured and cohesive. These are all characteristics of groups in general, but teams in particularly to an extreme. So a team is a group, an extreme type of group a super group, if you will, in which, yes, like all groups, there's interaction among members, but it tends to be uh, more concentrated, more continuous with all members engaged in the group interaction. Fewer isolates, uh, as you might find in, in other groups. Group members are seeking goals, in some cases individual personal goals, but a team generally has a collective outcome and interdependence is high meaning that if a individual doesn't contribute, um, then the group may not reach its collective outcome. 
Also, interdependence is often so high so that uh, individuals simply cannot succeed unless their group succeeds. Also, interdependence is high because the members typically have interlocking skills and abilities and role commitments. Uh, teams also tend to be relatively structured groups, so they have uh, clear lines of authority, communication, status patterns, and so on, and roles are often assigned. Um, there's specific duties associated with particular roles and the group members are aware of that. Teams also tend to be cohesive as well. They tend to be unified, but again in, in the broad sense of cohesiveness. So not just that individuals like each other, but they're committed to a common task. Uh, they have a high shared level of emotion and they're highly structured as well. So in my view, teams are groups, but very specialized, highly structured, extreme groups as well. Um, there are many different kinds of groups, uh, and, and uh, Dennis De Devine has described many of the varieties based on the context in which you might find groups. So, for example, in, in management situations, industrial situations, you typically find executive and command groups. Uh, exec these types of groups carry out management and leadership functions, usually within a, a larger organization. Project groups include negotiation teams, commissions, and design teams. These are all usually created to complete a particular task, tasks that require a variety of abilities and skills, judgment, discernment, creativity, persuasiveness, and so on. Advisory teams are review panels, steering committees, oversight committees, even investigatory teams that are sometimes put together on an ad hoc basis to perform their reviews. Um, work teams include service teams and production teams. Production teams would be an example of uh, an assembly line team uh, producing some product. Uh, service teams, as the name suggests, deliver services of some sort. So for example, uh, a repair team uh, that services your vehicle or a team of nurses uh, that attends to your needs when you're done times of illness. Those would all be examples of service teams. And lastly, the action teams uh, perform work in a particular context. So for example, uh, performance teams uh, might be a, a film crew, for ex example, um, doing a documentary shoot. Uh, there's medical teams, there's response teams. Those are the EMTs that show up at the highway accidents to deliver services. Uh, military teams, transportation teams, uh, transportation teams, the, the crew of an airliner would qualify as a transportation team. And of course, last but not least, would be uh, sports teams, um, which are perhaps uh, the prototype of many sorts of teams. There's other ways to look at teams. Some teams are relatively unique ones. Um, expeditions generally are, are teams, but they're mobile ones. They focus on exploration of unknown areas. So for example, a group of uh, Apollo astronauts headed to the moon. That would be an example of an expedition team. Crews are teams that generally make use of specialized tools in order to perform their tasks. Uh, that's the distinction between a team in general and a crew specifically. And lastly, task forces generally are limited based upon time. Uh, they have a particular work they're supposed to do. Um, also, there's a, a final set of groups, uh, not listed here, but ad hoc teams in which members are, are inserted within the team, slotted into the group for performance task. Many airline crews now function as these kinds of ad hoc teams whose members are added for each flight, for example. Another word for such teams is sometimes knots. Um, another way to distinguish among teams has been suggested by Dr. Hackman, who thinks one of the critically important distinctions among teams is how much authority they have in the work that they do. Uh, in some cases a team forms, but it is organized by uh, a leader, a leader who may not even be present in the group, who makes decisions about how the team should be organized, who's on the group, and the kind of work that, that should be done by the group members. In other cases, the team may have uh, far more autonomy. It, it can decide for itself how it's organized, what tasks it might accomplish. Hackman identifies four different types of teams on the basis of this particular variable. So he's got manager-led or leader-led types, self-managing teams, self-designing teams. They can create their own structure and also self-governing teams. And he differentiates them along this, these, uh, along 
these criteria. If the groups can execute tasks, monitor and manage their work process, they design the team themselves and the context, and they set their overall direction. Uh, self-governing teams can do all these. Self-designing teams can do three. Self-managing two. Manager-led teams simply execute the tasks. There's been a great increase in popular various kinds of teams. Uh, initially, cross-functional teams were a very popular application of the team concept, particularly in organizational settings. So cross-functional teams are ones in which uh, individuals from, from different portion parts of the organization come together to meet, to exchange information in many cases, but also to identify problems and solution to those problems. Uh, Cross-functional teams um, are difficult to teams, uh, basically. Uh, they often have, the members of those teams have different goals within the organization, and therefore sometimes uh, they are, the members of this these sorts of teams aren't able to work together cooperatively to ensure that the organization as a whole is successful. So conflict levels tend to be a little too high for efficacious activities and cross-functional teams. When should you form a team versus when should you work alone? Uh, earlier uh, we spoke about in general when it's best to work in groups and the same rules apply to teams as to groups in general. Uh, if the task is extremely difficult, if it's complex, if it's extremely important that you get it right, perhaps it's best to form a team. And in some cases, teams can just help individuals deal with tasks which are relatively monotonous. Uh, there are also, of course, a number of psychological and interpersonal factors that influence when teams come into existence. Uh, it may be the case that simple, it'd be better to work on a task with other individuals. People uh, have a strong need uh, to affiliate with others for inclusion in groups and teams satisfy that in part. In some cases, I think that teams are formed uh, so, so that no one single individual can be held accountable for a mistake, uh, if a mistake is made. So if you doubt your ability to make the correct judgment, if you wonder whether or not you have the skills necessary to perform the task effectively, why not form a team uh, so that blame can be diffused among the members of the team. In some cases, people seek out membership in teams because they recognize that they won't have to work quite so hard when they're in the company of others. And also, as it's been suggested, just as there's a romance of leadership suggesting that leaders are highly effective and that the work of a leader is far superior to the work of a follower, there is an element of a romance of teams the idea that teams are quite effective and that by default, if you encounter a new problem, why? Form a team uh, would be the default solution. And therefore, people sometimes form teams when they don't really need to. In terms of overall analyses of, of teams, uh, the, the classic model approach to understanding teams is the system theory. Discussed long ago, this particular image goes all the way back to 1975 and Hackman and Morris's presentation of the uh, systems model, the input process output model of teams, which they presented in advances in experimental social psychology. And as it shows on over here, we have the input factors, which could include individual level factors. What are the people like who are on the group? What's their personality? Do they have knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary for the group to achieve its goals? Uh, there's team level factors. How structured is the team? Is it a cohesive team? Um, does it have a leader? Is it, a, is it large? Are the boundaries of the team clearly defined? And then we have environmental factors as well. For example, the reward structure. Still, to this day, in many cases, teams are not well supported by their organizations because individuals who are, well, rewards are dispersed to individuals rather than to groups and therefore there's always a higher payoff for individual success relative to group success. All of these input factors feed into the black box of group interaction process which would define how the group members perform together and based upon that interaction process we have two sets of outputs. The performance outcomes, how well did the group do? Did it perform its task well? Did it work quickly? Did it work slowly? Did it make errors? 
But also, as Hackman has always reminded us, there's a number of other variables that can result from the group interaction process, including member satisfaction, team adaptation, and member development over time. Um, this basic model has been adapted in part over time to add additional components, but still the systems level view of teams basically is the predominant model of explaining when teams will be effective and when they won't be effective. In the next presentation, we'll move on and talk about building the team and working in teams and also how to evaluate the effectiveness teams. But in the meantime, thank you as always for joining me in the analysis of groups and their dynamics.